Hey, I, I want to begin with a question to you, and that is, why do we gather on Sundays? If we were in a classroom situation and we were open that up, a lot of us would say we gather on Sundays to worship. Uh, we gather on Sundays to receive instruction from God's Word. We gather on Sundays to sing songs. Uh, we gather on Sundays to give money. We gather on Sundays to get together with the body of Christ. And I suppose that all of those responses would be right. I, I think the real reason, the real reason why we gather on Sundays is for assurance purposes. We gather on Sundays because we want to be sure that what we believe is true. Because there are so many things in our world that pull us away. So many things in our world that says to us, whispers to us, shouts to us, the things of God are not true. The way God is in the Bible is not the way God is. We have friends saying that. Sometimes even the whispers in our own mind, our own soul, whisper those things to us. And so we gather on Sundays for any other reason, and there are all kinds of reasons, but we gather on Sundays because we want to be assured that what God has promised is going to come about. As so we gather, we garner strength, we garner enthusiasm about the things of God. Think about the songs that Jason and the team just let us in. Every one of them. And the same is true of the songs that Mark led us in the first service. Every one of them is about assurance. Oh, no, he might let go through every storm and every... Oh, no, he might let go. No, he won't let go. He won't let go. He's the anchor. He's the anchor to my soul. And I think we gather together on Sundays because we want to be assured that the things of God are true. And, and probably none of us would say that because then it would, it would look like we're not trusting him. The reason why Romans 9 is where it's at is not because Paul wants to pick a fight. Romans 9 is where it's at because Paul wants you to have confidence that you can trust him. You can trust God. You can place your entire life, your heart, your soul, your body, your future, your present, you can place it all under his care because you can trust him. The reason why Romans 9 is here is for assurance. And I bring that up because when we talk about predestination and election, all those things, all of a sudden we begin to think, well, what about my kids? How do I know that they'll be saved? What about me? How do I know that I'm chosen? How can I have assurance that, that, that when I professed faith in Jesus Christ, in my case when I was nine, maybe in your case at a camp or a retreat, maybe it was 50 years ago, maybe it was just last week, how do I know that that took how can I know about that? And Paul gives us Romans 9 because he wants you to know and God wants you to know about that. How do you know that you can trust God? Just in the way of review, um, up, up, Romans thus far, there are two truths that we've really hit on. Uh, last fall uh, or last w spring, we, we hit on this one. The gospel is the one true God's one true plan to make people right with him. That is what the gospel is. When we talk about the gospel, we can talk about the events of the gospel, Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, being buried, risen on the third day. We can talk about the gospel in that sense, but in a broader sense, the gospel is the one true God's one true plan to make the world right with him. And then last Sunday, we said that the main point of Romans 9, 10, and 11 is this. The only person God needs to carry out God's plan is God. And the reason why that gives assurance to us is because God's plan does not hinge on you performing. God's plan does not hinge on you doing the work. If that were the case, then God's plan is in the dumper. There's only one person that God needs to carry out God's plan, and that's God. You can trust him. 
In fact, we looked at last Sunday, the first point of a three-point two-sermon series. God can be trusted because his plan hinges on his choice. God's plan hinges on choices that God makes. It does not hinge on your choice or on mine. It hinges on his choice. Now, keep in mind, I want you to have this. I think the, yeah, the, the graphic is there. There is this vertical line, and there is this horizontal line. That horizontal line represents your story and mine. It represents that moment when we came to realize who Jesus Christ was, and we made the choice to profess in him. But that vertical line involves God's choice. It involves the work of God. And what we're allowed to see in Romans 9, 10, 11 is we are allowed to peek over the shoulder of God and we are allowed to see salvation from his perspective. What did he see when he saved you? What did he see when he saved me? And we find out it goes farther back than just the event of when you came to Christ. It goes even further back than that to before the foundations of the world. And so our salvation is hinged upon his choice. And then we come to number two in your outline there. God can be trusted because his plan hinges on his mercy. Your salvation does not rest on your decision. Your salvation rests on the mercy of God. And again, keep in mind, this is to give us assurance. It's not to cause us to ask questions about our own spiritual pedigree. It is meant to give us assurance that the salvation that God is offering you is hinged. It swings on his mercy. We see these, this in verses 14 through 18. And here's the question. It's almost in the form of an accusation. Is God unjust? In fact, we'll deal with two questions today. Is God unjust or is he unfair? In your community group, someone somewhere along the way probably asked those two questions, one of those two questions. Is God unjust? Or maybe the second question, is he unfair? Those are honest questions. And Paul anticipates those questions. And so in verse 14, he says this, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? We would ask that. Why? Well, mainly because of what he says in verse 13. As it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. What? Everywhere I've been told, all the flannel graph in Sunday school tells me that God is love, and now all of a sudden, he's saying, I hate. What is up with that? What's going on there? And you recall the story from last Sunday is that born to Rebekah and Isaac were twin sons. And Paul says before the sons were even born, before they had the opportunity to do good or bad, God chose Jacob. It wasn't based upon performance because they weren't born yet. God chose Jacob. He did not choose Esau. And that relationship is not the, 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 the word hatred there is not the emotional side that we would think of hatred. It's just simply a Hebrew way of saying God did not choose Esau. He chose Jacob. And so we ask, wait a minute, that, that doesn't sound, that sounds like it's an injustice. That sounds like God is being unjust to Esau. Well, what Paul gives us is a couple of examples in response to that. First of all, he gives an example of his mercy, and it involves Israel or Moses or both in verse 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Paul is making us go back in our minds to that episode in Exodus 32 and 33. God has already delivered the nation of Israel out of bondage and slavery. Miraculously, the Passover has happened. The Red Sea thing has happened. The people of God have seen these phenomenal miracles of God delivering them. Moses is called to go up to the mountain away from the people where he receives the law of God. And what happens to the nation of Israel while Moses is up on the mountain? What goes on? You remember? Yeah, they get in trouble. They get all of their gold together. They get all of their gold together and they melt it down and they forge and form this golden calf. 
And they worship it saying, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt. After all they've experienced, after all they've seen, they make for themselves a, an image, a calf, and they say, this is the God. And in short, God tells Moses, you better get down there because I'm going to toast them. They are done. I'm going to choose another people, and, I, and I'm God, and they have offended me. My justice is going to roll down on them. And Moses, on behalf of Israel, intercedes, and God shows mercy. And so Paul wants us to ask the question, why did God show mercy to Israel? Israel deserved justice, right? Don't you think? After all that God does in taking them out of Egypt, all of the miracles, all the plagues, the Passover, the Red Sea, the water, the manna, the quail, all the things that God has done to preserve Israel, and now all of a sudden they make a golden calf for themselves, and they say, this is the God. This is the God. Do, do you think that they deserve justice? Yeah, they do. But God gives them mercy. Why? The answer you may not like is because he wanted to. He's God. He will show mercy on who he wants to show mercy. Israel deserved judgment. They deserved justice. It would have been fair of God to completely destroy Israel and make another people for himself. It would have been fair. It would have been just for him to do that. But instead, he gives them mercy. But then he gives us another example. Oh, and by the way, going on, verse 16. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. God's choice, God's choosing does not depend upon your exertion or mine. It does not depend upon your work or mine, your performance or mine. It does not depend on your will or mine. It depends on his exertion. It depends on his will, not mine, not yours. And I think we got to stop here just for a second and, and breathe. And breathe here a little bit because we have some ideas on who God is. Justice from our perspective is different than justice from God's perspective. Justice from our perspective is that everybody gets a participation ribbon. Justice from our perspective is that God ought to let everybody in. That's justice from our perspective. God ought to let everybody in. Justice from God's perspective is God ought to let no one in. His justice demands that we pay for our rebellion just as his justice demands that the children of Israel pay for their rebellion and making a golden calf, making a false god. They need to pay. Instead, God gives them mercy. They didn't deserve mercy. If they deserved mercy, it wouldn't be mercy. They deserve justice. I think also that this kind of confronts us a little bit because we have this idea that everyone is born neutral. You may have heard, I, I, can, I can remember hearing an old time preacher, it's a very common statement back in the 60s and 70s, is the preacher saying, hey listen, it's like this. Jesus is on the ballot, okay? Satan is on the ballot, and you and I cast the right vote. That plays well in beautiful downtown United States. But what Paul has been saying for eight chapters, now nine, is this. If Jesus is on the ballot and Satan is on the ballot, Jesus loses the election by a landslide every time. In fact, in fact, he gets zero votes. We choose any way but the way of Christ. We are born into that. We are born already receiving and deserving of the justice of God. We are born guilty of sin. We are born in our rebellion. No one comes out of the chute neutral. The chute, by the way, is a biological term that those of us in the medical field, you know, you know. No, 
None of us are born neutral. As, as much as you want to think that mom, that, that beautiful little child of yours, that child is not neutral. They are not voting for Jesus by nature. There is nothing in them that would want that. Your child and my child have no hope unless God intervenes in that child's life. If you want to leave that up to your kid, your child has no hope. Your only hope and your child's hope is only in Christ and Christ alone. Our view of justice is that God ought to save everyone, but God's view of justice is that God ought to save no one. Israel deserved justice, they got mercy. But now we have Pharaoh. Pharaoh deserved justice and he got justice. Look at verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. We look at this and all of a sudden we have this sympathy for Pharaoh. Oh, Pharaoh, I'm sure was a really nice guy. And it may have been that he really wanted to come to Moses and say, Moses, I, I really want, I want to let the nation of Israel go. I really, I really love your God. And I don't want all these plagues. I don't, want, I don't want my son to die. I really want to believe, but God has hardened my heart. He has kept me from believing. And nothing could be further from the truth. You want to know why Pharaoh's heart was hard? It's because he had hardened it. And the fact is that there was a point where God said, Pharaoh, you do not want to believe in me. You don't want to submit to me. You don't want to worship me. Boom, you got it. I will give you what you want. You want hardness. You want disbelief. You want rebellion. You want rejection of me. You got it. Pharaoh, like Israel, both Israel and Pharaoh deserve justice. Israel received mercy, Pharaoh received justice. When God hardens someone, he, he doesn't create the hardness. He simply allows the hardness to continue. Verse 18, so then, God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Pharaoh received justice, Israel received mercy. Do you see this? The whole point of this is that the Christian life is founded upon mercy. The Christian life is not founded upon you or me paying off a debt to God. The Christian life, and that, that may be why you're here this morning. You're here this morning because you think, you know, it's been a particularly bad week. I have felt the frown of God on me. I'm going to put a smile on his face by showing up at church. And you think that somehow, that somehow, this, this, is, this is me paying off a debt to God. And the reality is this, anything that you or I could do cannot pay off a debt because God does not recognize the currency by which we pay. That's why, that's why in, your, in your study notes you've got a, a piece of monopoly money. How many of you have a $500 bill? Raise your hand. Okay, well you're the better people in this room. Okay, you've got a five, how many, raise them up, $500 bill, you got a five, this is a 10, $500 bill, you got a 500, lucky you, okay, how many of you have a $1 bill? Yeah, stinks to be you. <laughs> All right, so you've got the $1 bill, people, let's say that you're the worst of humanity. Let's just say, okay, let's just say that you are the worst of humanity. Those of you who receive $500 bill, you are the best of humanity, and so now we go down to hometown buffet, we strap on the old feed bag, we go to the buffet, and those of you with a $500 bill, you say, you know what, I'm going to pay for everybody in this room, and we all go, yeah, you. And we all have this really great meal, and you go to the cashier, and you say, I'd like to pay for everyone, and you put your $500 piece of Monopoly money down. What's that person going to do? Well, right after they call 911... Why, why don't they accept the $500 bill? Because they don't recognize it's not the right currency. 
Let's say that you have a debt to pay off. You want to pay off and pay some principal on your mortgage. And so you take your $500 bill and you go down to the mortgage company and say, I'll put this $500 towards the principal. And they would say, you're nuts. We don't recognize monopoly money. It's the wrong currency. The same thing is true with our effort. Those of you with a $500 bill and those of you with a $1 bill, God sees you as the same. Those of you with a $500 bill, you are no more deserving of God's grace than the people in the $1 bill. Because nothing that we can do, nothing that we could pay, nothing that we can give God could ever, ever, ever move him towards us. Because for all of us, whether you at the $1 or the $500 or the $5, the $10, the $20, the $50, the $100, whatever it was, we are all equally deserving of justice. We deserve his justice. And for everyone who professes the name of Christ, we receive his mercy. Our justice, our justice is what Jesus got. His mercy is what we get. Jesus got our justice so that we can receive his mercy. And every one of us in this room, no matter how good you think you are or how bad you think you are, we are all equally deserving of God's justice and through Christ, he is offering you now his mercy. And we don't deserve either one of them. That's number two. Number three, another reason why we can trust God. This is about assurance, right? You want to be sure that you're saved? Don't look at your performance. Look at the performance of Christ. Look at what God has done. Don't look at what you do. If you look at what you do, then all of a sudden your mind game, you're gonna, your mind's going to play tricks. And you're going to wonder, I wonder if I'm really saved. I wonder if I'm really saved. Number three, God can be trusted because God's plan hinges on God. Verse 19, this great image, this incredibly offensive image, image you will say to me then why does he still find fault it, listen it's a great question right listen if god is that in control if god can give mercy to israel even though they deserve justice and god gives pharaoh justice in the midst of his need for justice and if god is the one that decides that determination if he's the one that makes that choice why are we responsible for wrongdoing why, why am I held accountable for that? It doesn't seem fair. Why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? You know, he's asking, he's saying here, both the questioner and the question are out of order. It's one thing to ask questions to God. It's another to accuse him of wrongdoing. And Paul does not satisfy our curiosity here. Wait a minute, Paul. Why, why am I held accountable for things that I really ultimately have no control over. And Paul goes, that's like the clay trying to talk and complain to the potter. Why are you making me into an ashtray? I'd rather be a teapot. Now keep in mind, he says, that this potter-clay relationship, he, Paul is not saying that we are inanimate objects. What he is saying is the same relationship that the clay has with the potter is the same relationship that you and I have with the creator. Let me just say it this way. You and I are not, you and I are not self-determining individuals. I know I've just blasphemed the United States of America. You and I are not self-determining individuals any more than the lump of clay can determine what it wants to be. 
Let, let that sink in. Keep in mind, this is all for assurance purposes, right? Is that God has that kind of control. God has that kind of power over us. And what we must be careful of is in the midst of our screaming out, that's unfair, it's unfair, it's unfair, what happens is we take the creator God and we, we try to equalize ourselves with him, saying, you are not meeting my definition of justice. You are not meeting, you are not measuring up, almighty God, to my definition of love. And all Paul here is saying is, be very, very, very careful because you are accusing the one who is offering you mercy you are accusing the one of unfairness when you deserve his justice you deserve judgment I deserve condemnation when we shake our fist at God and demand that he be fair we are signing our own eternal death warrant Before we shake our fist at God, before we accuse him of wrongdoing, we have, to, we have to remember who he is. And we have to remember who we are. He is the potter. We are the clay. Now this is the part, and I, I've, I've taught this several times over the years, and what happens many times and I want to challenge those of you who know your way around the Bible, and right now, you disagree with pretty much everything that I've said. I understand. I, I was there. My wife was there. We wrestled with this together. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we cannot play buffet with who God is. For example, you come up to me, let's say, and you say, hey, Craig, how tall are you? And I say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm 6'1". Uh, no, you're not. I don't like anybody over six feet. You're 5'10". Well, no, I'm 6'1". Not anymore. You're now 5'10". Or I come up to you and ask you, hey, what's your favorite restaurant food? And you say, I really like spaghetti and meatballs. And I say, I hate spaghetti and meatballs. It is now steak. Your favorite food is now steak. I've decided that because I don't like to hang around people who like spaghetti and meatballs. I want to change who you are, even though it's impossible for me to change who you are. I find that this happens many times with God, is I will have people, I'll be talking about Romans 9, and they will say, I understand what Paul is saying, I just choose not to believe in a God like that. Okay, I mean, I, I guess you can choose not to believe in a God like that. I, you, I, you say, I, I know, I've had people say, I know that this is what the Bible says. I, I agree with what Paul is saying. I just, I just choose not to believe in a God like that. Then I guess you choose not to believe in the God of the Bible. Because whether you believe in him or not, this is who he is. And the reason why we have this is for our assurance. It's not to pick a fight. It's not to argue over. It's not to split a community group. It's, it's to, to have assurance that the God who starts something will finish it. Why? Because he's God. And that's what God does. That's who God is. It starts with his choice and it ends with his choice. That's why we can say he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the last. That's why we can say, oh no, he never lets go. He never lets go. He is the anchor for, we can sing those things. Why? Because he's God. And we're not. I'm not. You're not. Verse 22 and 23. He gives this scenario that there are things that we just don't know of God's mystery, of God's plan. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Underline that in your, in your Bible there. Underline that word prepared. It's very, very important because it's in the active voice, meaning it is, it is active. It's doing the work. In other words, what he's saying here is the wrath of God is coming because we have prepared ourselves for destruction. Pharaoh prepared himself 
for destruction. You and I, because of our rebellion, we have prepared ourselves for destruction. But then the word prepared shows up in verse 23 in a different voice. Look at verse 23. In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. If you have believed in Jesus Christ, then what Paul here is saying is, for God's glory, he has prepared you for that. He has worked in you. He has done all of the efforting. He has done all of the work necessary to prepare you for glory. It's just another way of saying, God is the one who makes the choices. Imagine this scenario. A guy commits a crime, he robs a bank, he hurts somebody, he gets convicted, rightly so, and goes to jail. And he's in jail because he actually did the crimes. He was found guilty, he did them, and so he's in jail. But then he holds a press conference. And the press conference, he, he, sa- he tells the reporters, I want you guys to know that I blame the governor that I'm in jail. It's the governor's fault that I am in jail. It's his fault. Because he could give me a pardon, and he hasn't given me a pardon, and so that's why I'm still in jail, because the governor has not pardoned me. And all the reporters, they, they all know what's going on. We know what's going on. So wait a minute, no, no, you're not in jail because the governor hasn't pardoned you. You're in jail because you committed these crimes. That's why you're in jail. That's why you're there, is because you have committed these crimes. Now, technically, could the governor give a pardon? He could, if he wanted to. But he chooses not to. But you're not in jail because the governor isn't going to give you a pardon. You're in jail because you committed the crimes. That's all that Paul is saying here. And we, we get this idea, I think, that somehow every single person is born with this seed of a chance to get in. And it's just not what Paul's saying. Trust me, I, I wish he did say that because that would swim, that would make a better sermon. But Paul is saying, no. We deserve justice, every one of us. And everyone who calls upon the Lord receives mercy. And people who call upon the name of the Lord, they're not calling upon the name of the Lord, not because God is keeping them from them, it's because they don't want God. They don't want him. They don't believe in him. They shake their fist at him. They've made their own. They become the potter. Their God becomes the clay. No one No one goes into condemnation saying, oh, man, I really, I really want to believe in Jesus, but I wasn't one of the elect. No one will say that. Because later on in chapter 10, we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, Paul says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Our text, it culminates with four quotations from the Old Testament from Hosea and Isaiah and all of those are simply saying, listen, this is not just about Israel. It's, I think a lot of people look at Romans 9 through 11 as just being for Israel. That's just not the case. Paul is always quick to bring in the Gentiles, saying this is the same plan for Israel is the same plan for the Gentiles. Assurance is not in you, it's in him. And now we know what's behind the decision. When you came to Christ, what was it that brought you to Christ? And, and you might tell a story like I told last Sunday. It, it was a Sunday school teacher. It was a relative, a parent. It was maybe a Christian movie or a retreat or a camp. And you look to those horizontal circumstances that, that, that preceded your decision to believe in Jesus. But if all we have is the horizontal where we made the decisions, then all of a sudden our assurance of salvation rests on our ability to decide. Yes, there was a time I chose for Jesus, but since my faith rests on my decision, there have also been times when I chose not Jesus. 
So is my salvation then up for grabs? Have I lost my salvation because I've chosen not? And Paul is saying, no, our faith, our, our salvation rests in the mercy of God. It rests in the choices that he has made on our behalf. You can rest. You can be assured. Why? Because your decision took? No, you can rest. You can be assured because everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In other words, the people who are not saved, they're not calling on God. They're not calling Jesus Christ Lord. They're not believing in his death, his burial, his resurrection. They're not believing in anything about that. And for them, there is justice. God is not unfair. They can't blame him. In their hardness. I know it's tough. It's, it's, tough to, it's tough to reconcile that stuff. It's tough to, to come to, to mind on what this is about. It could be that today you're here. It's your first time. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you are. And you can't wait to get out of here. Because you're thinking, man, the God that this guy's pumping is not the God I want to believe in. Try, I totally understand. I really do. But let me ask you this. What is the God that you believe in then? Is your God the God that you believe? Can that God disagree with you? Can that God surprise you? Can that God teach you? Can that God say no to you? You see, what happens many times, if our view of God is uninformed by the word of Scripture, we become the potter and he becomes the clay, and we mold a God into our image. We mold a God into an image that would look like us if we were God. I define him by my view of justice. I define him by my view of love. And I find myself being the potter, and he is the clay, and I'm molding a God that looks more like me than the God who looks like in the Bible. And pretty soon I find out that the image of God that I have really looks a lot like me. If I were God, I would do it this way. But the reason why Paul brings this up is not for us to shake our fist at God or each other. It's for assurance. You can rest in this God. How do I know if I've been chosen? Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Have you confessed that he is Lord of your life? Do you believe in his death, burial, and resurrection? If you say, yes, I do, but not a lot sometimes. Sometimes I don't have affection for him. Sometimes, sometimes I don't love him like, like, like I should. Sometimes sin is more real than my love for Jesus is real. Don't rest in your assurance in that way. Don't rest in your performance. Don't rest in your works. Rest in his performance, in his assurance, in his works. Your rest, your assurance is in Christ because whatever he starts, he finishes. If your assurance is based upon your ability to love God and show up at church and read your Bible and pray, then there will be a time when you will lose that salvation because you never had it. Because your assurance is not based upon you, it's based upon him. It's based upon what he has done. Receive, uh, boy, I know I'm yelling, but receive hope from that. Receive hope from the fact that if you have professed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it is because Jesus Christ did the same thing for your soul that he did for Lazarus' body. Live! Live! And the moment, that moment that you came to life, your affection for him grew. The reality of the truth of Christ came to your mind. And it, it wasn't that you had to believe, it's that you wanted to believe. That's the beauty. So the question isn't, have I been chosen? That's not the question to ask. Have I been chosen? The question is, do I believe? That's the question. Because if you say, yes, I do, I believe. I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord. I believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. I believe you're chosen. Because unchosen people don't say that. 
They don't live that. They don't embrace that. They don't love that. That's the reality of the gospel. Jason, why don't you guys come on up, please, if you would. The opportunity that we have to gather together on Sundays is this. It is to receive assurance. As parents, we desperately want our children to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We want them to believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Mom and dad, you could manipulate, you could coerce, you can even pay with Tootsie Rolls that your child will, believe, will say the prayer and believe. And you'll probably do more to manipulate them and do more damage to them than anything. Rest in this. Your child has no hope whatsoever unless God intervenes. And so pray for his intervention. Pray. Because whatever he starts, he finishes. If you're overwhelmed, and I just don't know if I'm chosen, if you have professed your faith in Jesus Christ, that is evidence of the choice that God has made for you. That is evidence of life inside of you. It's not just the words, but it's confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Every single person that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved saved, and we rest in that because it's not dependent upon our exertion or upon his, our, our will. It's based upon his mercy. Do you realize that? As, as we sing these songs, we sing these songs as mercy recipients. We sing to him because we deserved his justice, but he has given us his mercy. There is nothing in me that motivated him to give me mercy. I didn't have a $500 bill or a $1. I have nothing to offer him, and yet he has given me his mercy. And when we gather together on Sundays, we gather with that intent that Jesus Christ has bestowed upon me his mercy because it was bestowed upon him my justice. God was just in allowing Jesus to die because he took on your sin and mine so that you and I and all who believe in Christ can receive his mercy. Do you receive blessing from that? Do you receive assurance from that? That is what fuels our worship. That's what fuels us to come together and praise Christ because of what he's done and sing amen, amen, amen. Because everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, we get his mercy. We deserve his justice, but mercy is what we get. Let's stand together and think about that as we sing, okay? Thanks for listening to the Arcade Church podcast. Visit us at arcadechurchonline.com, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.